Uh, to put it in a nutshell, I was born in Pune, mm -hmm. uh, that's in the state of Maharashtra. And uh, I was very young. I was brought to Calcutta when I was three, as an orphan, and uh, grew up here, did all my studies here. I went to St. Anthony's School, I went to St. Joseph's Bobiza, mm -hmm. uh, School, uh -huh. and uh, eventually I went to St. Xavier's. Mm -hmm. And there at St. Xavier's, I became a librarian. Mm -hmm. So, just define for us, what is uh, an Anglo-Indian in India these days? Well, uh, an Anglo-Indian, according to the Constitution, is uh, a person whose uh, father, either European, British, you know, uh, had an Indian uh, woman, mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, of course, the offspring is an Anglo-Indian, mm -hmm. European, because when I went to Europe and went to Belgium, I was sitting in a pub when uh, the fellow told me, ah, you're an Indian. <clears throat> I said, yes, by nationality I'm an Indian, but by community I'm an Anglo-Indian. So he said, Anglo-Indian, I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> and so the book, the outcome of the book. Right. Uh, now, Anglo-Indians uh, was a strategy, in fact, uh, maybe a formal uh, policy by, introduced by the East India Company. That's right. Because they asked the then British single men who came to work here um, to take up relationships with Indian women. To marry Indian women, and they funded them for that yeah, <laughs> marriage. See, the, they, when you they, say funded, you mean when they had children, they would be uh, No, no, even for the marriage. Oh, yeah, see. you get married and we pay all the expenses for your marriage. Really? Yeah. So And uh, they encouraged the uh, young Tommies, mm -hmm. they were Tommy soldiers, you know. Mm -hmm. Many of them were not very educated, you know, dropouts from schools and all in London and England. And uh, when they came here, they married the fisherwomen if they were there in Kerala and the mm. south and all that, you know. Mm. And so as well as uh, marriage, they also, I understand, paid for every child that they Every child, out. that's right. They got an allowance. And do you know if the equivalent policies existed within the French and Dutch and Portuguese uh, systems? Uh, no, well? no, no. Just the British? No, just the British, because uh, the British... Uh, basically, you know, are uh, people who are very uh, shrewd, you yeah. know. They always uh, don't only look at the present, yeah. they look a hundred years ahead, right. <laughs> you see. So they had anticipated that if uh, children were born out of British stock, uh -huh. uh, they would be of great help to the uh, spreading of uh, the British territory values. Of British values, yeah. yeah. And uh, they were successful to a great extent, you know, because the Anglo-Indian knew his uh, Indians mm -hmm. and their languages and their culture through the mother right. uh, very well. Right. He could uh, mingle and make communication with the Indians, you see. I never thought of that. So it was a policy designed to secure the British position in India okay. through this, uh, this mechanism. So I want to get a feel from your personal memories of what Calcutta was like when you were a young boy growing up here. Oh, Calcutta was very, very flexible. It was very nice and comfortable. And uh, in the passage of growing up, like when I was eight, nine, of course, I was in the boarding school. Right. But uh, life there was so very different from uh, what it is today right. that I've uh, visited places. And we would go for picnics and outings, right. you know. And then uh, when I came into the city as a more, uh, as a young man, uh, when I came into the city, and uh, did my studies and all. I found Calcutta to be uh, a very, very nice place climat climatically uh, and also very hospitable. The people were very nice and uh, yeah, you could move around uh, freely and be happy. And then again, as I kept growing up uh, in my 20s, uh, my late, say 25, 26, um, Sunday entertainment uh, became the focus of everyone's life, oh, I, I, I observed. Right. Yeah. And uh, Park Street became the center of the hub, you know. 
and everyone in Calcutta would talk about, oh, you know, there are these little uh, nightclubs and, right. you know, singers and Anglo-Indian right. drummers and <clears throat> things like that. And uh, I found it very interesting because you could at that time travel around uh, the city, to any part of the city, at any part of the night. Right. And you were safe, and you were comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah, whether you were single or whether you went in groups or uh, you know with friends. Mm -hmm. So uh, all that in the past, uh, I consider today to have been the truly golden uh, period of time in Bengal's history. So when you talk about entertainment, you're talking about uh, nightclubs, dance halls. Theatre and cinema as theater well? Theatre and cinema as well. Right. Yeah, theatre and cinema as well. For example, there was this famous, uh, the New Empire, which still exists, uh -huh. but uh, <laughs> it's existing in a different uh, way. But the New Empire Theatre uh, showed uh, movies, uh -huh. plays also. Uh -huh. They removed the screen and showed plays. Uh -huh. And there was this young man called Casey Sin. He created uh, a thing called Bandwagon, you know, a musical show which would take place every Sunday on the stage. And uh, he encouraged uh, a lot of Anglo-Indian talent, you know, uh, men and women, boys and girls who loved music, you know. Uh, he gave them a chance to come and show your music, right. let us hear your voice, you know, and I was one of them. Right. I used to do slapstick comedy. You did? I wow. Did this, as I say, there's so much for that you to learn. <laughs> yeah. On the on the New Fire stage, I did slapstick comedy, and then I was known as Mel Fu Brown, you know, because I had a sort of a wig right. with a big, long, uh, you know, tail, a ponytail. What does Fu refer to? Chinese, ah. F O O. So, so it was an in inverted commas, right. Mel for Melvin, mm -hmm. Mel Fu Brown. That was my stage so, name for slapstick right. comedy. Right. I come from Hong Kong, born in Saigon. Making no difference. Born in Hong Kong, born in Saigon. Very big matter be I born. So that was one of the jokes. <laughs> so that was one of the jokes. And. Uh, Casey Sen did a remarkable uh, piece of work for the community, I must say. So, uh, huh. so in that time, when you were in your late teens and early twenties, I take it there would have been a lot more white faces around the streets here than I see today. That, that is true, that is true. Mm. Uh, yes, but I never really put much uh, thought to that, you know, now that yeah. you make me recall. But there were a lot of Europeans. There were a lot of British also, and uh, it was all right. Like nobody stood out. Like you know, the way you are trying to focus is like were there many <laughs> white faces? No, 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 not yeah. to that extent. And uh, at that time, one never thought of such a thing. Mm -hmm. What's your recollection, if any, of uh, independence when it came to India? Well. Um, 1947 and onwards. Well, um, in the beginning, in the beginning, it was very difficult. I know for uh, the people I was friendly with. You know, uh, it, it was a very difficult time because everyone was in great, uh, well, fear and uncertainty. Fear, uncertainty, and. Uh, of course, they had very good reasons to be afraid and uh, to be uncertain because the British had left. And most of the Anglo Indians, 99% of them, were thinking that, oh my God, what's going to happen? Uh, will the Indians accept us? Right. You see, because we are half uh, British. You see? Will they accept us or will they slaughter us? Because uh, then, you know, you had the Pakistan and the, India. the division yeah. and the, the massacre that took place and, and that put more uh, uh, fear into the people. I know people in those days were very, very afraid. But then, but then, uh, that was 47, 48, 49, 50. In, in, uh, by the time it came to the 50s, everyone seems to have, seemed to have come to the realization that uh, the Indians were very happy to have us. Right. Uh, no. It was 
strange to most Anglo Indians because the cream of the society had made an exodus right. to England, Australia, wherever they could go, they went, but they didn't want to stay here. Right. So I should say the cream of the society right. had uh, gone away. Right. See? And what was left behind, uh, well, I won't say dire cream of the right. society, <laughs> but there was still a few. Uh, well-known people and uh, rich people, Anglo-Indians, who were here, but uh, they were a handful. They were just a handful. And then we came to realize that the Indians uh, were very happy to have us. Is that in part because the Anglo-Indian community achieved some formal recognition in the Indian constitution? Um, no, I don't really think it was that. That was there, no doubt, in the subconscious right. mind. Mm -hmm. It was there. But uh, this one-on-one, -on -one, as I'm saying, yes. um, yeah. meeting the um, people at all levels of their society, you know, uh -huh. meeting them, uh, one came to realize that they were so happy that we were here because we represented what they had lost. Right. So in a way, it was the reverse of the original policy by the East India Company to maintain, through the offsprings of Anglo-Indian families, uh, and enhance the Britishness. What happened after independence was that the Anglo-Indian community stayed in India and helped to support India. India, that's right. As well. hmm. uh, and that's what even uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi had said. Uh -huh. It's a very famous thing about the Anglo-Indian uh, people. And that's even mentioned in one of my books. I've given it a special right. place. And she phrased it so well and so nicely that because of the Anglo-Indian community, mm -hmm. India has advanced right. at that period of time, you see. Yeah. And uh, there was some sort of uh, coalition there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stephen Smith. Now, Stephen Smith uh, was uh, involved in uh, the Indian Airmail Society in testing of rockets, rocket mail. Um, he, Stephen Smith, grew up uh, around here somewhere. Yes, yeah, Stephen Smith grew up on Elliot Road. Uh, now I'm at number three and he was around the corner, you know, uh, at that time. And uh, I did meet the man, uh -huh. I did meet him on two occasions. Right. Uh, no, was that? No, no, no. That was his son that I met, Stephen Smith's son. Yeah, and uh, I spoke to him. He lived on the corner at uh, 25, I think. 25. Yeah. yeah, Elliot Road. And then I did write uh, about Stephen Smith. Uh, his works that he did, but they were all snippets, just short, basic uh, things about the man. So Stephen Smith, he died in 1951. Um, the recollection you have of meeting his son Hector, um, where did you meet him? What class uh, I met him in the 70s, right. yeah, late 70s. And uh, in what connection? Well, the first meeting I had with him was when someone came and told me, an Anglo Indian family came and told me, I say, you know, he's selling a book rack, a book rack and a dining table and uh, odds and ends. And if you would be interested, I said, I'm very much interested in a book rack to start with. And uh, so I went across there and uh, I bought it from him. Oh, I see. Right, so it's a book rack from probably a book rack that uh, Stephen Smith would have used himself. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So uh, I bought that. I still have it with me. Uh, the book rack. Uh -huh. And uh, then I spoke to him. He invited me for lunch and my wife and things like that. And um, yeah, that's what I can say about. Uh, did he 
at that time talk about his father's work in uh, rockets and ammo? Uh, he did, he did tell me, and then he told me that uh, he had read something I had written, and uh, he said it was nice, but he said there's much more that you could have said about the man. Right. <laughs> you know? So I said, And as far as you recall, what did um, Hector Smith and, and his wife, uh, his son stayed here, but um, I understand Hector and his wife at some stage went to England. They emigrated to England and the cold uh, affected him and he died soon Absolutely. after that, yes. Right. And that was mainly due to the uh, cold. Right. He couldn't bear the cold over there. Yeah. Do you remember approximately when that was? Uh, that was in the 80s, I think. Yeah. 80s.